Okay, we go to uh, the title types of error. Now, when we, the best part of uh, analytical chemistry, when we run an experiment, we will always, always produce data. Okay, but then we have to remember from the start of it, sampling, sample prep, and the analysis part, every single step must be religiously adhered to. You must follow very closely the procedure outlined in the, all the various steps. Any, uh, if you do not follow any of the steps, the whole sequence of analysis is won't produce a good data. Your data cannot be accepted. So I'll remind you again, even a small part of the sequence of analysis from sampling, preservation, uh, and then your sample prep, and then your analysis part, and then produce your calibration, which includes your calibration part. Any of that sequence, any step in that sequence, if you do not follow the, the real step or the correct step, your data is totally not correct. Okay? So this is basically uh, what we are trying to discuss, the types of error. Some error are small that we can just minimize it and uh, it won't affect the quality of your data. Okay, now we go to the first one, gross error. So gross error is obvious error that give readings that cannot be accepted. And when you have a gross error, so all the experiment had to be repeated. And this is what I meant just now. Okay, every single step in the sequence of uh, uh, an, uh, analysis, you must follow it. You take good sampling, composite sampling, but you do not preserve the data, uh, the, the sample. And then you go through all uh, sample prep, the correct step. That small part of not preserving the sample will make your data as a gross error. There's a gross error in your analysis and your final data cannot be accepted. Even though it's that small. Okay? So if you are not using the approved method, since you lack any instrument in your lab, Okay, you don't have the big budget to buy a good instrument. So you use, uh, for example, uh, UV to detect metals in the part per billion level. Certainly you will, cannot, cannot uh, detect the small concentration of your analyte. And you will put that as undetected. And it's already accepted. But that's not the purpose of using that UV to detect in part per billion level. Because the purpose is to detect it in part per million level. So you are using the wrong instrument. So it's a gross error. So similarly, if you are using arsenic, using flame AAS, where else in your lab you have graphite furnace or hydride generation, you are choosing the wrong technique. Because arsenic is volatile. As such, the resident time in the flame is very short and you do not, the, the, the technique, uh, sorry, uh, flame resident time is very short. As such, you cannot detect in, in part per billion level. It can only be detected in part per million level. So you are using the wrong technique. So you are now trying to determine a volatile organic. And you use HPLC because you see there's someone using it. So you use HPLC. Now again, it's a wrong technique. HPLC for high boiling point organics, whereas DC for volatile, using the wrong analytical technique. And in your samples, because you have a lot of samples, and the recommended technique is by using standard addition or even internal standard but instead since you have a lot of samples so you prefer to use external calibration method again wrong technique being applied because the matrix 
if the co that complex samples may interfere, may interfere. And if your recovery is less than 80, more than 120, that interference is extremely significant and you cannot use external calibration method. So again, you are using the wrong technique. So even though the analysis produce data, that data cannot be accepted. And this is what we call generally as a gross error. You put in all the efforts in sampling, in sample prep and in analysis, but at the end of the day, your data cannot be accepted because it is it includes that which contribute to the gross error. The second one, what is called as random error. Now you follow closely all the steps, but somehow when you run five replicates of your sample, you are surprised that it cannot have the same value. You'll see, for example, 0 0.5, 0 0.48, 0 0.52, 0 0.55, 0 0.45 for all the five replicates of the same sample that you are running. What contributes to that error? Because you have followed closely all the procedures. And these are what we call as random error. We are practically not sure what is the source of that error that cannot produce the same value. But it has a good precision. And all the differences are what we call collectively as random error in which we cannot eliminate. So it's okay. The data can be accepted. The mean with the small standard deviation of the differences okay, between the data so this is what we meant as a good data, although there are some differences due to random error in which the error itself we cannot eliminate. Okay, and the third one, what we call as a systematic error, is can be determined, and once you uh, you you know what type of error, uh, what what causes the error. It can be avoided or it can be corrected okay there shall be several sources that contribute to that error in it is maybe from your instrument from uh, the step in your the method that you are using and also maybe in terms of your personnel the staff that is running the sample and this is so important that we will further discuss in the next uh, in the next okay in the next slide now when you are observing the reading observing the reading you can identify the systematic error okay if you have a true value of 10 for example uh, and then you observe that all readings of the replicate that you are uh, studying shows reading of above 10 or all the five replicates shows reading of below than 10 then these are signal that suggest the data is not correct that th there must be some systematic error in it when every group of uh, reading that you obtain all replicate shows above or below the true value in a good data uh, some of the reading may be above the true value. Some of the readings must be below the true value. Okay, more than 10, less than 10. But in a systematic error, all values are above 10 or below 10. So similarly, in the step where you use your QC in checking the, uh, the performance of your method or your instruments and every single QC will show 95% or between 95% to 105% meaning that is good it's good to run the samples but when you gather all the QC for several days if you observe the value of QC is always above the value of the true concentration of the QC or below the concentration 
then probably you should recheck back your 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 method or your instrument there may be systematic error so all this method error uh, systematic error as such will contribute uh, to decrease accuracy or decrease precision and affect the result of your 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 the that may affect the data itself okay let's discuss further the systematic error now instrument error so probably your instruments there are some uh, is old is old instrument and there may be some fault in it or you are not calibrating it correctly or even you do not have a yearly uh, preventive maintenance okay or in my case for example uh, example that i did it uh, last time we have did it last time where uh, for the glass apparatus we do not use pyrite a low grade and then we realize that the volume is not accurate okay and all the other apparatus uh, we do not calibrate it the thermometer the balance as such so these are examples what we call as instrument error uh, not properly calibrated or you are using a low grade uh, low grade apparatus now how to minimize the instrument errors so in a calibrated or oh, sorry in a, an accredited lab we uh, must calibrate our instrument with a certified uh, company okay for everything our glassware such as volumetric glass a burest thermometer balance and we must do a preventive maintenance record of the instruments okay we must do it to show that we do the calibration the the, the all the apparatus and all the instruments are correctly calibrated now again in your daily uh, analysis in your daily running of the samples all instruments must be calibrated you must uh, check for the you must uh, sorry check the ph meter check the analytical balance you must calibrate your instruments all these are procedures that you must carry out on a daily basis okay before running the sample the instruments must be cut uh, correctly calibrated so these are what we call as instrument error so make sure the instruments are calibrated okay the second one is the method error okay so the method error when we already adopted a certain method and uh, in real cases in real cases some student or some researcher prefer an instrument over another instrument preferred some uh, technical stuff this technical stuff i want he to to analyze the sample not the other one so there are some doubt in the data being produced so that's the reason why when we involve we are involved in proficiency testing in the national level to ensure that to confirm that uh, we have trained the staff and we calibrate our instruments and we use the correct method and all the data are very good so uh, to dismiss all uh, doubtful all are we person that are doubtful with the data being produced so that's what we did to minimize the method error so all the staff will undergo the training okay continuous training in the instrumentation and we enroll the staff in proficiency, proficiency testing in a sense that they must pass that proficiency testing in order to qualify to run the instruments okay being trained and being tried in a testing exam and that confirms to us that all the errors that they may contribute to the data will only be in the form of random error now we also run many method validation parameters especially for annual auditing okay all the uh, parameters that we've discussed recovery uh, limit of detection limit of quantification 
uh, repeatability, reproducibility, uh, what are the linearity, ruggedness, as such. All these uh, method validation uh, parameters must be tried on if you have a new star, if you have a new instrument, or if you are proposing a new method. All this must be tried so that the method is validated. So does the instrument and come along the operator. Okay. And in daily running of your samples, you must also do, uh, please, please do everything that being suggested. Let's look, for example, when you are running AAS study. So what do you do? You must run a blank. Okay, and then you must also prepare your standard calibration plot and run the QC. So your calibration plot must zero must be 0 0.99. R squared must be 0 0.99. And then your QC must be within 95% to 105%. And in running the QC, make sure that the R RSD is less than 10%. So every time when you run this and you check all this uh, all these steps that it conform to to the needed uh, quality then only you can run your samples okay so this is uh, what the daily checking when you are running all the samples on a daily basis or even not on daily basis uh, every time you run a sample okay you must run with blank and the QC and check the linearity, the check, uh, run the QC and the RSD and then only you can run your samples. Any failure in the uh, linearity, R squared is not equal to 0 0.99 or your QC is not within the 95 to 105 or 90 to 110 or your RSD is more than 10% you cannot run these samples you cannot run the samples okay and in some cases we also can run analysis of srm standard reference material so what is this so if your lab normally embark on analysis of fishes then it's suggested for you to buy uh, fish SRM of fishes. So this SRM is still a fish sample, but along with it comes a certificate. Uh, the values of all the metals of organics or whatever this, there is inside the certificate. So there is a true value of your sample. Our normal samples, our normal water samples or our normal uh, fish sample that we studied, there is no true value. We do not know the exact value. But in the SRM, you have a true value. So when you are running the SRM, and through what we call as a one tail T test, okay, you run five replicates, and if your value, the, the value that you obtain is within the range of the value of uh, what is being stated in the, in the certificate, meaning that there is no systematic error. So you can really confirm that your method selected, your method is being carried out very well, your staff is well, uh, very competent, and your instrument is well calibrated. So it's a confirmation studies of the status of your data, and your data from all running of the sample can really be trusted. So this is by analysis of SRM. Or if you do not have any standard method, no, uh, sorry, no standard solutions or SRM. So you are running using your instrument AAS, you can compare it with another instrument. Okay, run using this instrument, replicates, you got a mean. And compare that with any other established method or you can send it to any 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 lab okay to a, a accredited accredited lab and compare your data with the data of the accredited lab or which is very well established
So if it says that your data based, based on what we call as a two-tailed t-test, so if your data, mean of data, and the mean of data of uh, the reference laboratory shows that there is no significant difference, so what can we say? The data produced in our lab is correct. So this is what we call as uh, testing with two or more independent laboratory or different instruments in which we are trying to confirm and confirm that the method or the samples or the data produced in our laboratory is correct. So this method. Uh, okay, the third one is what we call as personal error. Personal error is uh, due to the incompetence of uh, the staff or uh, indiscipline or basically or probably the lack of integrity, the lack of passion in running the instrument, running the analysis that she is trying to pro produce a good data. Okay, so uh, some technicians are just not competent, are just not competent enough to operate major instruments, which is quite complex and the steps are quite tedious in the sense that they must calibrate the instruments, everything, all the steps must really be added to and not competent to operate on the instrument and its sample preparation step. So our major instruments of AS, GC, HPLC, ICP, all are very good instruments. But again, you need competent staff to run that. Competent staff with high integrity. Because if you are running a lot of samples, okay, a lot of samples, so some what we call as a preconceived idea of a true value. Okay, preconceived idea of a true value. Uh, you run 10 samples, you see that all the readings are almost the same. So what do we say? Okay, the next sample may also have the same value. So you put in the value without running the experiment. So this is what we call as uh, the preconceived idea of a true value or lack of discipline or lack of integrity in the staff of, of running the samples. Okay, what this is what we call as personal error. So to minimize the personal error, we must enhance the competency so that the basic knowledge in terms of theory, in terms of the sample preparation, in terms of the calibration, in terms of uh, uh, the, the analysis, in terms of the all steps, they must have a good understanding in the theory and the practical running of the instrument, including some simple maintenance. And then they'll be enrolled in the same thing, uh, enrolled in the testing, uh, testing, proficiency testing, and to make sure that uh, they are being, being, uh, they are already confirmed as those who pass the proficiency testing. Now, periodically, if you have, uh, if you are running a lab of running a lot of samples, so one method. Uh, being suggested, you put in a blind sample among all the many samples that you have. Okay, put in the two or three blind samples. Now, what is a blind sample? A blind sample is actually a sample, a standard concentration, a standard solution of known concentration, which is known to you, but unknown to the technical staff who are running the samples meaning that he does not know the presence of a blind sample. So he imagined that every single sample he is running is an unknown sample. So unknown to him, but known to you, you are now putting in a blind sample in which the concentration is very far away from what is normally expected of the concentration. Examples. Normally, uh, the normal concentration of your effluent industry, industrial effluent, is 1 ppm. Okay, so you put in a blind sample of 5 ppm or 10 ppm, which is very far away. 
Okay, so you insert it. Now, when you come up with the values uh, of the analysis, so if it is you get it 10 ppm, it shows that ah, the stuff is running the sample. Okay, so he said, oh, that's an outlier. But if you observe that all values are almost the same for all the sample, then you really can confirm, okay, by putting, just now by putting in two or three blind samples, that some samples are not being run by the technical staff. So this is the purpose of the blind samples. To check in whether when you have a lot of samples, all samples are being analyzed or not by the technical staff. Okay, so this is how we try to manage the personnel so that the error are minimized. The staff not only are competent, but have the integrity and have the motivation to run it as correctly as possible in order to produce a good data. Okay, let's go now to common statistical parameters uh, such as mean or average, median, range, standard deviation, relative standard deviation, and variance. Okay, the mean is of course the average value of all the replicates that we are studying. Okay, the median in which they are being arranged in increasing order or in decreasing order. So if it is an uh, odd number, easy, you select the middle. If it is even number, then you take the two in the center and you divide by two. Okay, so that is a median. And then the range, the range in which the smallest number to the highest number, that is the range of the data. And then the standard deviation. So the mean and the standard deviation is extremely very important. So standard deviation, when you are running five replicates, you can calculate the standard deviation. And that will reflect the precision of your replicates. A small value of S as standard deviation, a small value shows that the all the data are very precise. High precision, very close to each other. And the closeness is based on the random error. There is no method error, there is no gross error involved in it. Only random error. Okay? Uh, since normally we have only very small number of samples, so we use the first one, S, rather than the sigma, which reflects samples more than 30. So we use the above formula, okay? But again, I'm suggesting to you, do not use the formula. Instead, use your calculator based on the statistical function to try to calculate the, the standard deviation. It takes you a, a short time to calculate it using the statistical function. Do it, because in the exam, you do not have enough time. And then after obtaining your standard deviation, your mean, then you can calculate your percent RSD. Okay, uh, so RSD is basically your standard deviation divided by mean times by 100, you get the percentage of RSD. The value of standard deviation, 0 0.2, 0 0.003, it does not bring a lot of meaning because it's not being compared with the concentration, the mean. But when it's being shown in the form of RSD, so if you have a value of less than 10% and you are dealing in the concentration of part per billion, so it shows that the precision obtained, the data obtained is very, very good. Now look at the formula. So to have a small percentage RSD, you must have a small, okay, a small, sorry, a, a small S, okay, the value of S is small. Now, if the mean of the data, the concentration, okay, the mean concentration is big, then it's very easy for you to have a small RSD. Now what happens if you are dealing in very small concentration? 
Your standard deviation divided by a small concentration. Now, it's very difficult then to have a small RSD less than 10%. That's what I mean. If it is, you have a RSD less than 10% in part per billion level, your data is extremely very good. Okay, and then your variance. Variance is your standard deviation squared. So that's the value of variance. And we will use in uh, one of the, uh, the statistical tests later on. Okay, now give examples and try to, these are the examples and try to check your calculation actually. Okay, so uh, determine the content of selenium in a batch of brown rice. So use your calculator, use, use your calculator to calculate the mean. Okay, and then to calculate the standard deviation. So you must have your mean around 0 0.077 by using the calculator, please, by using the statistical function. And then you must get the standard deviation. Use the statistical function 0 0.007. And then please calculate the RSD. Okay, so these are just uh, for you to test your ability to use your calculator, statistical function to calculate for the mean, for the uh, standard deviation, and your RSD. Because you need a lot of these in uh, the further examples okay now what's the meaning uh, accuracy what is meant by accuracy what is meant by precision these are the two words normally encountered uh, in data analysis accuracy precision now precision is based on running replicates okay running replicates and then how close the data is. And that is being reflected by your standard deviation. Okay, so you run five replicates, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I, I have to check you again. What is meant by replicates? Is it a single sample? And then you run it five times? No, that is not a replicate. That is running Five times the reading is taken five reading for a single replicate but for a true replicate from a sample you take five sub samples 0 0.5 gram from first one to 0 0.5 gram 0 0.5 gram 0 0.5 gram 0 0.5 gram and you run all the experiment for the replicate that is what we call a replicate okay so uh, that is replicate so running for a single replicate and get five data out of it, that is not what we call as a replicate. You just repeat the reading five times. Uh, you get a small standard deviation. Now it's being checked by uh, two of the parameters that we are involved in method validation. That is the first one, reproducibility. And the second one is rep repeatability. Now reproducibility, Okay, running, running the same replicates at different time. Meaning that I run this replicate today, I run the same replicate tomorrow, I run the same replicate next week, for example. I should expect if the method is reproducible, I would get almost the same reading with good precision so it's reproducible the method is reproducible the instrument is able to give reproducible data meant by a very competent technical staff so that is what meant by reproducible you use an instrument in our lab and you operate on another instrument and another lab and uh, if both labs are uh, well maintained, it should give you a reproducible data. If I were to test the, uh, the one of the samples, and another staff will also test the same sample, if both of, of us are competent, we should get a reproducible data. 
So we are comparing it between this, between the disk, or between laboratories, or between staff, to check for reproducibility. For repeatability, we are running replicas and repeat it over a short period of time. For all replicas are run today. So we check the repeatability. And if it shows a good uh, precision, small standard deviation, so it reflects that the method is repeatable. Okay, so these are what we meant by precision based on standard deviation, small standard deviation, good precision. It reflects a good method that we are employing. The second one is based on accuracy. So uh, to check for accuracy, you need a true value. And a true value can only be obtained if you are running samples of standard reference material or samples of standard solution in which the concentration are known. And then only when you run the sample replicates of that SRM, you check against it, then you can only confirm the nearness proximity to the true value compared to the value as shown in the certificate. So this is how we check for accuracy. If you have a very accurate, if you want to say that you are, you produce accurate data, how close is the data to the true value? Okay. Okay. Look, look at the uh, the diagram concerning accuracy versus precision. Okay. How many replicate? Two, four, six. So there are six replicate being carried out in the experiment. So the first one it says that it has high precision. So why high precision? All the six, okay, all the six replicate is very close to each other. So high precision. And in the same time, it is high accuracy because this is the true value. Okay, this is the line is the true value. So all data are very close to the, to the line. So showing that it has very high precision and very high accuracy. So these are the type of data that we wish every time we run an analysis to get it. Very good precision, very good accuracy. The second one, okay, it has a high precision. So high precision where all the values are very close to each other. So high precision. But then it has very low accuracy. Although high precision, but very far away from the, uh, the true value. So low accuracy because of very far away from the true value. Okay, the third one, it has low precision. All the data are very far away from each other and low accuracy. So we, when we get the mean, it's very far away from the true value. So low precision, low accuracy. Now look at the last one, it's quite interesting. Okay, it has a low precision and then it has a high accuracy. What? A high accuracy. How can it has a high accuracy? Because all the data are far away from uh, the true value. Now, all the data, we will calculate the mean. We will calculate the mean and somehow by magic, the mean is very close to the true value. So that's the reason why it says high accuracy, but with a very low precision. Now, can this data be accepted? Can this data be accepted? So for this data, we have a very good mean. And now look at uh, how we check our data. Okay. Uh, when we have a QC, we must show that it will have a value of less uh, 95 to 105% or 90 to 110%. But in the same time, if you can remember that we, it must also have RSD less than 10%. So not only it is accurate, 
95 to 105, but it must also be very precise, less than 10%. So in that case, if you are checking based on the requirement, then this data cannot be accepted because it is accurate, but the precision goes haywire. It's not, doesn't have a good precision, so these are not accepted. So if you summarize it, these are not accepted, these are not accepted, these are not accepted, and only this type of data can be accepted. High precision, high accuracy. Okay, I would like to add a further, a further, a further thing. What I meant by, look at this data. Okay. If you can remember, I mentioned to you about systematic error. And it can easily be identified when the data is always, all the data, all the replicates are more than the true value or less than the true value. Okay. More than the true value or less than the true value. So in this case, in this case, the data, all the data, all the data, the seek replicates, every single data are above the true value. So easily we can identify there is a systematic error. Now, okay, so the data cannot be accepted because of the presence of systematic error. Now, I'll give you an, another option. All the data, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, are very close to the true value. So now, there is high precision, high accuracy. But every single data is less than the true value. So can this data be accepted? Okay. So high precision, high accuracy. But there is a systematic error. So can the data be accepted? No. There must be something wrong with your system. Okay, there must be a systematic error. So this data, even though it's precise and it's accurate, but cannot be accepted because of the presence of systematic error. Uh, we put this in values now. Okay, comment on the accuracy if the sample is 10, uh, the, the true value is 10 and the precision of the following result and explain it. Okay, look at the first one A. So the first one A, you get five replicates and every single one would give a value of 10 and the mean is 10, standard deviation is zero. Very good value. Without any random error. Now, can the data be accepted? Can the data be accepted? No, this is a clear, clear uh, demonstration of what we say is that a preconceived idea of a true value. You know the true value probably is 10. So what you do without running the experiment or running the experiment, but you do not get the data, the real data. Instead, you put in your own data. So you give it 10, 10, 10, 10, showing that you are a remarkable chemist. <laughs> really, this is the worst type of chemist that we can have. Without any integrity and putting in the data that we can easily identify that this must be a gross error. Put in the data without depending on the real result. So this cannot be accepted. Okay, the second one, what we call just now as the same one as systematic and the presence of systematic error because all the data are very good actually the standard deviation is very good and i think the mean is very good 10.08 or 10.1 but you see all the data are above 10 so it's not a good data okay so this data if you look some up above 10 some below 10 very good no systematic error in that but uh, not that accurate and not very precise, not that precise. 
so this is not a good data okay so similarly this one is uh, a very good accuracy but the precision is not good so this data very good accuracy very good precision okay so in this case the clear error is over here really you can discard this data without any any thought you discard this data it's just very unlucky for this that none of the data goes in so this must be systematic error so this one can also uh, cannot also be accepted so the third one the fourth one the fifth one can be accepted in a sense that uh, all uh, are good except that this one have a very bad uh, precision not a good precision and this is the best of the three data okay the next one we would uh, be studying about several statistical tests uh, to evaluate the validity of our data again i remind you when any data are being supported by statistical tests it gives you a very high value of the data meaning that we would be very certain that that data is good can be accepted without any doubt so a uh, statistical test that we are uh, will discuss is about one tail t test two tail t test the f test and then the q test okay so one tail t test uh, refers to studying with uh, srm with a known true value the two tail t test about the comparing between two means when there is no true value and f test to check for the uh, any significant difference between two set of precision and the final one to check for the outlier the q test okay we'll go to each individual test before we go further to that uh, statistical test let's get a real understanding what is meant by confidence level confidence limit and confidence interval and i wish would use the formula for uh, that we use for uh, student t test okay mu mu is the true value mean is the mean of all the replicates being run and t is a special value it's a value that we obtain from the curve based on the degree of freedom then there will be a t table okay uh, s is the standard deviation you obtain from all your replicates and n is the number of samples that you run five samples five replicates meaning that five the n equal to five and then there is the term confidence level so we have a later on confidence level of 90 percent 95 percent that we normally use there are also 99 percent uh, there will also other values but the most often value being used are 90 percent or 95 percent and then there is the confidence interval and then there is a confidence limit okay uh, the next slide will explain the difference the, the later on uh, slide i'll show the difference uh, look at the we are discussing about distribution of error now if you have all the uh, replicates data what we call as a normal distribution it will give you a bell shape so the bell shape uh, as described over here so it's just the bell shape so this is the bell shape the yellow in color okay so these are the bell the bell shape and what we are expecting if your confidence level is 90 percent we are considering all the data from here to here so meaning that if your data distribution from started from here up to here we are only eliminating a small percentage of data and take into account a large amount of data but we if we reduce it to 80 percent so this amount of data is not being accepted this is not being considered so only in blue is being considered so these are where, what meant by in terms of the distribution of error the blue area are what is uh, the data distribution in which we are considering 
So that means the confidence level when we are seeing it uh, at 90% or at 95%. So it says over here, 90% of the time the true mean will lie between that range, the blue range is found of the measurement mode. Or in other words, 10% of the time, the true mean will not lie between that 1.64, uh, 1 I think, if 90%. Okay, 90%, 1.64, not 1.29 over there. So this is what we meant by that level. Okay, that confidence level uh, can really be illustrated if you look over in the T-table. Okay, the T-table, if you look, in terms, there are 90% and then there are 95%. Look at the value. Okay. If we were to have uh, seven replicates, normally we would look at what we call as a degree of freedom. So seven replicate, degree of freedom is seven minus one. We had to look at six. So we look at six and look at the value. If we are using... 90% we would use the value of t as 1.94 and if we have 90 at 95% we would be using the value of 2.45 meaning that the value of t increasing as we increase the confidence level from 90 to 95 so exactly what happens we are now considering 95% of the data. Let's put into perspective. What is my age? Then someone will answer me. Uh, my age is between 5 years to 95 years. Is it correct? Of course, it's correct. Even Dr. Mahadi is correct, 94 years. So it's correct. But would that data be meaningful? What about if he were to say, my age must be between 55 to 65. He's correct. But this time, he reduced the amount of uh, probability to a very small probability. And that is a more accurate uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the, what we call as a, a range, a much better range between 55 to 65 rather than between 5 to 95 both are correct but the range is too big so a more meaningful uh, description is the second one so it's similarly that's what the t will say if you have a small t the range in which uh, you are sure that the data is within that that amount that range that would be a better answer that's why when you are so sure about your, your analysis, use a 90%. So I'm using a lower T at 90%. Similarly, when you look uh, based on your replicates, whether to use three replicates or whether to use seven replicates. Okay, if you use three replicates, meaning that degree of freedom is, so you have 2.92 of your T value. If you use seven, you are using 1.94 that means to say as we increase the replicates we are becoming more sure about our answers more replicates the confidence level of where our true value is located will be much better okay so that is what is being represented by the value of t Okay, let's look into the examples of what is meant by a confidence interval. Okay, confidence interval. So, uh, calculate the confidence interval at 95%, 90%, 99% confidence level. Now, a new, new word is now confidence interval. Given the following uh, sam rock sample, calculate calcium and you put in a 5 replicates, you get a mean of 14.27, the standard deviation of 0. 037 okay and the value of t based on degree of freedom 2.78 and based on the formula where mu is the true value so the true value is the mean plus minus what is called as the confidence limit so 
So you are using plus minus confidence limit to find the confidence interval. So these are what is meant by the confidence interval. The range 14.37 plus minus 0 0.05, you get what is meant by confidence interval. The smaller is the confidence limit, there will be the smaller is the confidence interval. So if you get a confidence in limit to be very small, so what do you need to have? You need to have a, a, a small t. Okay? So again, if we refer back the, to the previous uh, t table, smaller t, it can be obtained if you have more replicates and also a higher, uh, sorry, a, a smaller uh, confidence level. 90%, you have a smaller T compared to 95%. More replicate, you will have a smaller T. Okay? And then a smaller standard deviation, more precise data. So, and a bigger N. So, if you have a smaller T, smaller S, and a bigger N, then you have a very small confidence limit and then it will produce you a very small confidence interval in which you really predict that your true value of your unknown would be within that small range okay now uh, 14.37 again if you change from 90 percent to 95 percent so the confidence limit becomes 0.05 because the value of t will increase the when you change it to 99% the confidence limit will be 0 0.08 because the value of t will increase so that's why uh, if you want to be more very specific you go to a lower confidence level okay now i'm done with what's the meaning and the effect of confidence interval confidence limit and confidence level on your distribution of data. Okay, let's look at the first uh, test, statistical test from the four that we will be studying. So the first one is one tail t test, or better called as student t test, and it is used when we have a known true value. So a known true value. Uh, you can use SRM, standard reference material, the true value uh, in the certificate, or FAPAS. FAPAS is actually sampled from uh, standards Malaysia, used for testing of proficiency tests of uh, various laboratories, or you can also use standard solution. Okay, so these are examples of uh, solutions or samples with a true value. And you analyze this all the standard solution or SRM or FAPAS and use that as your samples and check for the presence of systematic error. Now let's put in the example. So 10 measurements being made and give you a mean of 0 0.461 with standard deviation of 0 0.003. So the true value, okay, the true value have a reading of 0 0.470. Now, show whether there is a systematic error at 95% confidence level. Look at the data. The true value is 0 0.470, whereas the value that you get is 0 0.461. Now, our normal uh, instinct would say that it's extremely very close to each other. So, can the data be accepted? Yes without the statistical test. Now check whether uh, using statistical cell will support our, our judgment. Put in the value. So uh, what's the value of T? 2.26 from the table of degree of freedom of 9. And then you put in the value and put in the formula all the value and you get 0 0.461 plus minus 0 0.002 or 0 0.3. Okay, if you put it at 0 0.002, this means that is 0 0.459 less than the true value, less than 0 0.463 at 95% of the time. Okay, so the true values you predicted to be between that range, the, the confidence interval. 
0 0.459, 0 0.463. What about the true value in the certificate? 0 0.470. So what does your conclusion say? It's not in the range. Okay? It's not in the range between 0 0.459 to 0 0.463. So since the value is not in the range, our conclusion says that, that based on the statistical, statistical test says that there is a systematic error at 95% and the data cannot be accepted. Wow. Very close, but based on statistical test, the data cannot be accepted. Because at 95% cannot be accepted, certainly at 90% the data cannot also be accepted because the value of T is smaller than at 95%. So this is how we make our judgment. Based on personal judgment, it can be accepted. But when we want to support based on uh, the statistical test, it says that the data should be rejected because there are systematic errors. So this is the value of statistical testing. Uh, the other way of reflection, uh, whether data can be accepted or not, is based on what we call as the significant test, the hypothesis, null hypothesis. So uh, if HO is accepted, no significant difference, and we say that uh, we can accept the data. So based on the null hypothesis. Okay. Uh, when the T test is being uh, made based on that null hypothesis, we look into what we call as the T calculate. So the formula is being rearranged as T calculate rather than uh, initially is based on mu, mu equal to uh, mean plus minus ts over delta n the, that, the the formula is rearranged so that now we are calculating based on t rather than based on mu so it says that t calculate based on your calculation and you compare it based on your table okay the degree of freedom based on the table look at the value it says that when the t calculate is less than the t table means that there is no significant difference between the t calculate and t table so your conclusion would be there will be no systematic error okay let me repeat you make the calculation based on t and then you compare that with your t table if t calculate is less than the t table your conclusion would be there is no systematic error but if your t calculate bigger than the t table you say that there is a systematic error so the example previously given is based on your confidence level uh, confidence interval meaning that if your true value is not within the confidence interval there is a systematic error. So if you uh, make calculation based on the t-test, based on the confidence level, or based on the uh, null hypothesis, this one based on the t-calculate, both should give the same answer, whether there is a systematic error, or both will give, there would be a no systematic error. It should be the same. It cannot be one will give you uh, no, but the other one would give there is a systematic error. No, both would give the same answer. So you can use either one of the technique. Okay, look at the example given for one tail t test, student t test, based on the null hypothesis. So now the formula, if you look into the, the box, red box, so it's being given in term of t. Okay, so plus minus t is mean minus the mu divided by root of n divided by your standard deviation you would get the t calculate is calculated to be 4.38 okay it's 4.38 and based on the table so this is the value that you obtain based on your calculation 
okay, based on the calculation. So this is the value. And this is your T table, 3.18. So what would be your conclusion? The T calculate is bigger than T table. Okay, the T calculate is bigger than T table. So what does that mean? Since T calculate bigger than table, so the hypothesis is rejected. So there is a systematic error. Okay, so this is student T test. So your conclusion always result in the presence or the absence of systematic error. Let's look at the second uh, statistical test. It's based on what we call as two-tail t-test, comparison of two means. Okay, comparison, uh, comparison between means of two samples, two means of two samples. So, it is used when the true value is not known and it checks for the presence of significant difference. That would be your conclusion, significant difference. Now, it's used, when, when would it use? If I have, uh, I'm running a sample, okay, to check whether my method is good or not as such, I would compare my data with the data given to a reference laboratory. Okay, I would compare these with a very good uh, laboratory. So my means and my, the means of the uh, laboratory is being compared. If I want to check my new technical staff, I would I will give him the same sample and compare the means of the technical staff compared to the uh, experienced staff. Or if you want to compare between two instruments, run, give the same sample to this instrument, run with this instrument and compare to with a reference instrument. So these are comparison between the two. Okay, so I write it competent versus new star uh, between two instruments, between two laboratories. And you would check uh, T calculate, the same procedure, the T calculate bit and uh, whether it's less than the T table or not. And whether there is a significant difference between the two data. So instead, we use standard deviation. We use what we call a standard you pull standard deviation but it's pull pull standard deviation because right now you got two means two data with two means so use the formula okay uh, let's look at the formula so this one is you should uh, observe that is s squared standard deviation the variance okay is given in term of variance the pull variance so that is the formula is correct and or you can use uh, sp but not a square root so you have a square root of it so this one is correct so this one there is a mistake i pointed out by that so it's n1 minus n2 no it's not correct actually it's n1 minus one okay so this one is correct so that's why i put in the new formula so n1 and two are the numbers of data the number of replicates in set 1 and set 2 and where else the ns is the number of data set you are studying about two data set comparing between two set meaning that they are the number is 2 okay so you insert in all your data into this formula to obtain the standard deviation pool standard deviation of your two means okay look at the examples so, uh, the quality of wine identified by determining the alcohol content of the different barrels. So, now you are checking whether in barrel 1 and barrel 2, is there a significant difference in quality? So, barrel 1 gives you a mean of 12.61% okay, uh, of alcohol. X2, uh, the second one, would give you 12.53%. SP, using the previous formula, Okay, using the uh, previous formula, you get it at 0 0.07. And you insert into the T calculate. Okay, you insert into the T calculate and you get the value of 1.7 as the T calculate. And based on the T table, now look at uh, the T table. 
how would you do it? How would you do it? Okay, now, so the first one is using six replicates. Okay, six plus four, the second one. So six plus four because there are two sets of means, so ten. Minus the number of sets. So you are using because it's degree of freedom n minus one. So the other one is also n minus one. So n plus n minus two. So you get a degree of freedom eight. So the C table based on 95% is 2.31. T calculate 1.7. So since T calculate is less than T table, so what can we say? So there is no significant difference between the quality. Okay? Is there any difference between the quality? Yes. 12.61. 12.53 but is there any significant difference meaning that is there the, the difference is the difference significant based on statistic there is no significant difference meaning that if this value is being applied to comparing between uh, uh, your staff technical staff we will say that the result obtained by your new staff and the competent staff, there is no significant difference. Meaning that you have trained that new staff very well. Or if your result is compared to a reference laboratory, there is no significant difference. Meaning that your data is as good as their data. So this is why we do it uh, for the two tail T test, comparing between two means when we do not have a true value. Now we go to the third test, what we call as the F test. Okay, we compare the precision of two methods based on the variance, S squared. So it's called one tail test, two tail test. Now, this is not one tail T test. Look it carefully. It's not one tail T test. It's not two tail T test. This is just one tail and two tail. So we are using here. Uh, is a two tail test that is uh, whether method A and method B differ in their precision okay so we use F equal to uh, the variance as standard deviation squared and standard deviation divided by the standard set deviation up standard deviation squared of the second data since uh, you want the value of F to be always bigger than one as such the more precise the more precise meaning that have a lower uh, lower number a smaller number will always be the denominator that's how we arrange it okay now if f calculate and then you compare that with f table if it is smaller than f table means that there is no significant difference in precision okay no significant difference in precision okay go to the example you have a proposed method you run it replicates and you get a mean of 72 milligram per liter 72 ppm with a standard deviation of 3.31 and then the standardized method with nine replicates 72 ppm also but with a standard deviation of 1.51 now look at the value of standard deviation. Is there any difference? Yes. The first one is 3.31. The second one is 1.51. The standardized method has a lower standard deviation. As such, it is a more precise. Okay. There is a difference of precision where the standard standardized method is more precise. But the question arises is not which is more precise the difference is there any different in the the different in precision is it significant or not so we put in the value into the f uh, formula and we find that it is 4.8 and we look from the f table i'll show you after this the value of f table is 3.50 so what's uh, how to compare it? So F K 
calculate 4.8 is bigger than F table. As such, we say that there is a, a difference in precision between uh, the standardized method and the proposed method and the difference in precision is significant. Okay, or uh, as written, there is a significant difference in precision between the two methods. So that is our conclusion. There is a significant difference between the, the two methods because F calculate bigger than F table. Okay, uh, we look at the, how do they look at the F table. So this is the F table. So numerator, less precise, eight samples, eight replicate, and we use a degree of freedom of seven. And then uh, the second one, we use nine replicates, so degree of freedom of eight. And then we look at where they join it. So the value is 3.50. So that's why the value from F table is 3.50 just now. Okay, so this is how we compare uh, between two variants in terms of the precision. F test to compare uh, precision between two data. Again, uh, repeat the uh, experiment. So it says that determination of CO using standard procedure has value of 0 0.21. And then the method was modified and improved. We give you a better precision, 0 0.15. And the second one is 0 0.12. So all technique use 10 samples with 9 degrees of freedom. So the question arises, is there any difference in precision? Yes. Okay. The modified technique are much better. But are the modified method significantly more precise? That's the question. Is it significantly more precise than the standard method? So you put in the value and for when it is 0 0.15, it is 1.96. And then when it is more precise, you get the value of 3.06. So from the table, from the F table just now, it is 3.18. Okay, 3.18. So make that comparison. So F table, okay, F table, is small F1, sorry, uh, F calculate is more less than F table in both under both occasions. So what is our conclusion then? When it is uh, less than F table, uh, F calculate less than F table, so there is no significant difference in precision between the two methods. Okay, so no significant difference, meaning that. The difference is not significant. And finally, we go to the Q test. So the Q test or the Dixon test. So when running an experiment, sometimes you get a value which is very much different compared to most of the value. Okay. Uh, so the question arises whether you want to reject the value or not. Look at the example being given, 10.05, 10.1, 10.15, 10.05. But then you see a value which is very far away. 10.45 compared to all the other values. So what would you say? Just reject the data. No, you cannot. You must employ statistical tests. So now the question arises, do we keep that data? Or do we reject that data? So how do you do it? You first, you arrange the data in terms of ascending order. So when we arrange it, so this is what we obtain. Okay. So if you look, the final value, okay, the value that we are testing, compare that to the second last value. 
So you see a big difference. So can the data be rejected? So it occurs actually both ways, on the high end, on the low end. But in this case, the low end is 10.05, 10.05. Uh, it's the same actually, the same value. So certainly uh, you cannot de delete all the uh, 10.05. So you have only one sided. Okay, you check only one data. So uh, you use the Q test or the Dixon test. So after arranging it, that you put that into your uh, value. So let me elaborate it. Okay, 10.45 the value in dispute, and this is the value next to it. Okay, the second last value, 10.15, divide by the range. So the range is the highest value, 10.45. And the smallest value is 10.05. Okay, so Q experiment is 10.45 is the value that you are trying to check minus the value next to it, 10.15, divide by the range, the highest value, 10.45, divide by a minus 10.05, the smallest value. So you get a value of 0 0.75. Okay, so this 0 0.75, you compare this with the value in the table, Q table. So the Q table is based on the number of observation. I repeat back. For all the three methods previously, uh, student t-test or the two-tailed t-test or the f-test, we based on degree of freedom. But from the Q test, we are not based on degree of freedom. Instead, we are based on the number of observation. So there are six uh, numbers uh, being tested. So n equal to six, and from that you get a value of 0 0.625. Then you compare your Q calculate, Q experiment, 0 0.75 compared to 0 0.625. So you find that Q calculate bigger than Q table. So when Q calculate bigger than Q table, the data that is 10.45 can be rejected. But if Q calculate is smaller than Q table, the data cannot be rejected. You must include into your whole data. Okay, so this is a Q test. And this is the Q table. So uh, this is the number. I'll just uh, focus on it so that this is not a degree of freedom in that the number of observation how many data are included so these are the values so you just now we have six data at 95 percent so it's 0 0.625 okay finally the last slide examples again okay you have a series of data the following data were obtained for the definition of nitrate concentration in river water so these are the values so you must rearrange first in ascending order. And right now, uh, what is the value in dispute? Okay, the, the value is 0 0.380 on the lower end. Okay, so 0 0.3080 minus 0 0.40, but remember you must take this, all values must be in positive, modulus. Okay, modulus 0 0.380, minus 0 0.40 divide by the range the highest value is 0 0.413 the lowest value is 0 0.380 and you'll get a value of 0 0.606 whereas the Q table is 0 0.570 so since you calculate bigger than Q table the suspected outlier is rejected okay so these are the Q test and that finally and our presentation into the four statistical tests that we use to support our data. Okay, the first one is the student t-test. What is used for? To check for systematic error either in personal well, or in method and also in your instrument. That is a Q test, a student t-test to check whether there is a systematic error and you use SRN for that testing okay the second one is two tail t-test 
you check between two meals. Okay, normally, uh, two meals and uh, one of the meals is a reference. Okay, the best uh, technical stuff, a reference laboratory. So you are comparing a new method to an old, uh, to a, uh, a good method. Okay, a reference method, a new method to a reference method as such. So that is a style of comparison between the two means, two tail t test. And the third one is the f test comparison, the significant difference between two means and finally the q test. Okay, so these are the statistical tests we will be involved. Hopefully you can study it very well, look it, listen to it, and hopefully you will understand it very well. Any questions? please contact me. Okay, thank you very much. Stay home, stay safe, beat COVID-19. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera.